Hi, I'm Mo, and oink, oink. And I'm TJ, and in the event podcasting doesn't work for us, I took the liberty of signing you up for a local mafia pork smuggling operation. Thank you, TJ. That's right. And this is... It's still new to us, damn it! Welcome to It's Still New to Us, damn it! I'm Mo, he's TJ, he just said, and we're here to watch every movie ever made to be invited to parties. There's Halloween parties ab uh, yes. abound, right? I can see some at my neighbor's house, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's like they're having fun. I, it does look like they're having yeah. fun. Why, why are they laughing at us? They're, they're staring out the window and just laughing at us and pointing. Are we maladjusted? I don't know what that means. It's them. It's them that is the problem. Okay, yeah. <laughs> they're the problem. Yeah. Let's go hiss at them. Yes. Yeah, like they're silent movie villains. Yeah. We don't want to go to their party anymore. Yeah, definitely not. I'd rather be here recording about yeah. this, uh, this uh, Shohei Imamura movie. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Definitely. Definitely. But if there's any nice people out there that want to invite us to things, please I'm all ears. Yeah. Yes, please. I'm waiting for the one day somebody actually does invite us for this podcast or something. And I will politely decline yeah, because exactly. I'm a fucking introvert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, but there's a party going on in um in a uh, in Saskatchewan going on. I want to come. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, sounds uh, good. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, we'll, we'll go. yeah. Okay, if it was not local, I would actually probably be more inclined to go. Yeah, because I like traveling and seeing new places. Mm -hmm. Doesn't even have to be a destination. Uh, Rachel and I went to. Uh, we stayed up in Bridgeport last. Wait, week. hold on, hold on. This is not official yet. It's not special banter time. You can't oh, talk oh, about I'm sorry. Yet. I'm so sorry. You can't talk about other things that are not yet banter, TJ. You Here, must I'm, wait. I'm removing my finger right now. Thank you. My fingers yes, the that's right the punishment. Now. I apologize. For, for, not, for, not, for bantering doing not banter. I fucked up. But my point is I'd rather go party internationally than yes. around the block. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's true. Yes. Okay. Now, TJ, we now enter the banter time. Highway to the banter time. Damn it. We don't get that right still. Once again, we do this once a month. We always mess up. I'm pretty sure last time, too, I said time and you said zone. I could be wrong. I could be wrong, yeah. I'm leaving this all in, but, you know. Anyway. Someone listening in a different country, let us know. Yeah, definitely. Anyway, we've not entered banter zone. Um, it's now, now you can talk about your, <laughs> your life, TJ. Oh, I was just going to say, I love visiting even mundane places. Yes. We, know, we went up to Bridgeport to golf last weekend, and we stayed the night up there. And it's this charming little town right next to Frankenmuth. But Frankenmuth hogs all the, yeah. you know, the fun, right? The tourism. Bridgeport looked just like, uh, I don't know, it's like a historic little city. It was kind of yes. cool. I don't know. I but as you know, TJ, shit. every small town has its secrets. I'm not going to lie. I don't know how to describe it. And this will sound insane if, to most people. That, si that town had a very Halloween for the return of Michael Myers feel to it. I get it. Yeah. That's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody's been, been Small replaced town. by little ones. Yeah, I understand. No, no, uh, just that's Halloween 3 season of The Witch. Oh, yes. And ev I just watched that the other night. Again? <laughs> well, I am watching through that whole series so that I can rank them for my cousins. Awesome. See, this past was it, September, we had a Friday the 13th. Yes. And out of the blue, I decided, what the hell? I'm going to send my cousins a ridiculously overlong ranking of the Friday the 13th series. None of them watched this, the, the movies, yeah. by the way. So I sent them this text message in our group chat. We basically have a shit posting chat. Yeah. And I sent, I typed it all out on Google Docs. It's probably, it was like three pages long on Google Docs, single spaced. Mm -hmm. Like I put way too much effort into this. Yeah. Talk. I, like I put more effort into that than I did do my podcasts, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, full disclosure. And I sent that to them. Maybe one of them read it or skimmed it. But it's more or less just a shit post thing, right? Yeah. So... This Halloween, I'm going to send them a, a ranking of the Halloween movies, but those are less fresh in my mind. Yeah. I just watched six. I'm through six. I watched the producer's cut of it, and it's just as bad as six, the theatrical cut. Six was... Paul Rudd one. Paul Rudd. Yeah. Okay. There I is... thought I confused it with Friday the 13th for a second, because I was going to say Take Manhattan, but that was... Oh, that's, that's part, part eight. That's part See, eight. I'm a big fan of Friday the 13th, just because growing up, I thought that's what horror was. Like, yeah. I, because those were the movies that, oh, yeah, I'm not that... supposed to watch these, but they're on AMC, so yeah. they're movie classics, they're movie right? movie classics, yeah. I remember I was, like, I was just getting, like, I was in middle school, that's when you start, like, exploring stuff you, mm -hmm. you think you like. Mm -hmm. I remember, like, renting Friday the 13th, I'm like, oh my god, this is going to be, like, the greatest horror movie of all time. Like, this yeah. is a classic. And you just watch it, you're like, oh, this is just kind of normal horror movie and it's like okay it's okay and yet it's stuck yeah through genius marketing and a chair a chair jumping ending i think that's really what hammered it down and the fact that paramount turned it into a business we're gonna make the same movie every year people pay to see it yeah i just wish that they'd had more fun with it because i i read a lot and watched a lot of the documentaries about that series paramount was 
openly embarrassed by that franchise. Yeah. But it made so much, it had such a high return on investment, they'd be stupid not to keep making them. Yeah. So I wish they would have had fun, like posting things on the on the movie theatrical poster that said like from the studio that brought you the godfather or like <laughs> yeah. or post like the Roger Ebert one star review an in, immoral and reprehensible piece of trash or something yeah. like that like that would have been fun they never had fun with it yeah it's not like Nightmare on Elm Street of course that Nightmare on Elm Street built a studio so it's, it's different even though yeah. they were so treated like they were Friday the 13th I mean New Line Cinemas did not give a crap about about Friday the 13th at all. There was no. like, no, there was Once like, they got the rights, no, they didn't give a shit. They didn't give a shit. Yeah. So they were just like, yeah, just do whatever you want. And, uh-huh. you know, if it's good, we don't care. Like, we're just. Yeah. Basically, it's like Saw. That's the, it. It's just like. Yeah, pretty much. They were, uh, I believe, one of the Paramount producers referred to Friday the 13th as exercises in commerce. Yeah. That's all it was. But at it's least. Kinda, like, it's kind of a shame that's how, like, every mm-hmm. horror movie franchise has been treated ever. It's like, yeah. first it started Friday the 13th, and then they're like, okay, we're going to treat that. Okay. Technically, Halloween. Halloween's the one that really yeah. started this last year boom. Halloween's a great movie. Yeah, it's true, It's yes. a very, very, very good great movie. movie. Yeah. It starts, you know, it gets the copycats going. Friday the 13th is easily the, the most successful of it, the copycats, right? Yeah. Those are the exercises in commerce. Every one of them is basically the same. Yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street comes along and is actually artistically clever. Yeah, because what something Lewis Craven's actually a great director. So it's right. Be... It's different. It allows for fun artistic expression in a way like the dream sequences allow for a lot of creativity yeah then halloween says oh shit we need to get back in on this trend we're waste we're losing money by not making more of these and then they haphazardly just throw michael myers into these horrible horrible yeah. movies where he's now a cult the tool of some cult it's fucking terrible yeah. and it's i like, love them that's like every but every horror movie franchise you know like once you get the one movie then you just keep on pumping them out pumping them out to make cash yeah. and they don't care like nobody cares about like, anything like like, I think about Saw. It's like, Saw is, like, an equivalent to, like, the Nightmare on Elm Streets mm-hmm. now. Maybe not as popularity-wise. Like, I don't know if kids today, like, man goes Saw, like, oh, Saw was awesome, you know. Yeah, like, I know what you mean. Probably yeah. not. Yeah, it's not going to be, like, I don't, you may, you're going to see some jigsaws and, like, horror convention and stuff. I don't think That's it's going to have the same kind of sentimentality that people have for, like, the Friday the 13th or the Halloweens or the Nightmare on Elm Streets. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, because... Yeah, why is it? Is that because Freddy, Jason, and Michael were, like, the first slasher icon could be it could be because of maybe more entertaining i mean think about jigsaw i mean he's a little puppet he's a little puppet man yeah and you got like like the pound activity movies like those are not going to be like remembered as like as like fun like master like not masterpieces but like fun movies to watch it's like a haunted house movie yeah i mean well literally it is but that's really the appeal to going to see that first paranormal activity yeah when they came out with others i said didn't we say enough with the first? I didn't. Yeah, even it's not going to be as well remembered. I, I don't think. Mm-hmm. Like, I think at least Saw. I think will be, but I don't think like the Paranormal Activity movies are going to be. First Saw is well remembered. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be well remembered as like any other movie, like horror movie franchise. You know, no, the Saw franchise became what Friday the Thirteenth is. It's something that you know that teenagers are going to go to with their dates, and they're going to cuddle up on each other. You know, whatever. Yeah. Um, exercises in commerce really does apply to yeah. a lot of, to that series Definitely. as well. Yeah. Um, I wish that Halloween had been given the license to do what John Carpenter and Deborah Hill wanted to do, which was the anthology. Yeah. Because Halloween 3, as fucking stupid as it is in a lot of ways, I still love it because it tries something so bug nuts insane. Mm-hmm. Um, but because they had done with Halloween 2 a direct sequel to the first one, they you know they missed their opportunity yeah. at that point, right? So what have you been up to? Well, um, I've been I watched The Fog recently. The John Carpenter's The Fog. I love The Fog. It's a great movie. It's just a very straightforward, very straightforward ghost movie, which is actually really great. You know, I, it was actually like really short. I didn't expect it to be like, oh, it's just they just showed up and that's it. It's very refreshing. Yeah, yeah. It's just a straightforward pirate ghost story. It's framed as a campfire tale. Yeah, right. It's perfect. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, love like Jamie Lee Curtis is in it. With Tom Atkins. With Tom Atkins, yeah. Tom Atkins hooks up with a girl half his age. Yeah. And then while they're in bed, he asks, so what's your name again? <laughs> That's my favorite part. Yeah. Yeah, no, I actually rewatched that too once you mentioned that you watched it. Yeah. I had some free time. I watched the Columbo where Jamie Lee Curtis is a waitress. That's right. I was like, oh, it's Jamie Lee Curtis. He's that's in the right. Columbo. That isn't, that's not the same one that her mom's in, right? No, I don't think so. Okay. No, the wait. Forgotten Lady or whatever? I think it was. Is it? I mean, that makes sense. I think it was because he was following somebody. I think it was, yeah. That would make sense. The one with her mom is an under That's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. Definitely. Um, let's see. I uh, went to the theaters and we watched Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Great movie. That's a 
Probably, such a great movie. Probably my favorite Batman movie. It's know. probably objective. I gotta, I gotta watch the Dark Knight again, maybe. But it's just, mm. it's so good. When, when Joker blows up that the futuristic town, and you just see him laugh, it's like he, he knows he won. Like no matter what, like yeah. he can die right now, but he knows like the lives will be miserable no matter what he does. So it's, it's like the end he, of Seven. Yeah. He yeah he the killer dies, but he won. He got what he wanted. Yeah. So spoiler alert to Seven. Yeah. Uh, and. Mask of the Phantasm, but yeah, no, Mask of the Phantasm is fantastic. Yeah, it really. I love how I love it um, because they're just like it. Definitely, Warner Brothers was like, "Can you just make a movie real quick about Batman? You know, just like just get us some ties and tie-ins in, make some more toys or something like that, cheapo." And Bruce Tim and Paul Paul Dano or Paul Delaney, Paul Dini, Paul Dini were just like, "Okay, we'll do that," and they made definitely one of the most like heartbreaking portraits of Batman ever. Beautiful character study. Yeah, I was just that, like, that really the emotional weight of which has not been matched by any of the live action movies. No. Ever. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's a great movie. It's a shame it flopped at the box office, but it, it obviously made its money back in the long yeah. run. It's amazing how well that show is aged. Yeah, and I think it's because of its art direction, the Art Deco style. It's so yeah. timeless, right? Yeah, but that's the thing about what many man about DC. Yeah. You know, DC like movie wise, not doing so good, but like animation wise is always the top of the game no matter what yeah so because now they just did the new batman they did the amazon batman which is actually really good and mm-hmm. then, yeah the holly quinn in it it's amazing um i love how they we introduce um the old wolves gallery in like different ways and stuff like yeah, that yeah it's about time that they try something different yeah yeah i like the new uh what is it, the cape crusader or yeah whatever. the cape crusader i yeah. enjoyed that yeah. um so yeah you also got um uh what's his name uh, tim gunn he's uh mm-hmm. He's releasing the uh, oh James Gunn. James Gunn, sorry. Yeah, yeah. He's releasing the Creature Commandos. It's gonna come out soon, so that's gonna be fun. Superman, the new Superman. Some new Superman, yeah. yeah. So that's gonna be exciting. But yeah, DC needs uh, some real help. Uh, now yeah. the whole comic book movie industry right now. Needs yeah, help. Definitely. They're gonna keep. But animation going. wise, like I think, well, I think recently the DC animated movies have not been living up to the standard of them. You know, I haven't really yeah. seen them, but. You know, I heard like they're not really living up to the hype that they were doing like in the mid two thousands and stuff like that. That was a golden era. You know what? Say what you will. They never have had their live action ducks in a row for a, an expanded universe. DC, yeah. But their animated stuff was top notch. Yeah. For probably a 15, 20 year stretch. True. It was so freaking good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, um, I also watched The Substance, which is an amazing film. It's body horror to the max. I love it so much. Like, it looked intriguing. It beats, it beats society out the door. If you don't know what society is, TJ, it's a movie released in 1989. I've seen it. It's basically, it's like no plot at all. It's fine. But yeah. the body horror in it is fantastic. It's some of the best body horror you ever see in cinema, definitely. And that, like, this kind of tops it, you know, because it beat, because it has a better story, better acting, better directing, and also, so hard, whether. Could this top society as like a better body horror? As like as I'm talking about like makeup and prosthetics and stuff like that. I don't know, but it, it was. I think it does. I think it does. It's just okay. it's so good. I think Demi Moore deserves an Oscar nomination at least. I'm sorry. Yeah, Demi Moore deserves an Oscar nomination at least. It's just so good, it's so disgusting, and it's like this perfection. It looked great. Yeah. The trailers. Um, it looked great. Mm-hmm. I. Uh, oh. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say I watched the original Suspiria the other night. Oh, that's cool. I've had like two weeks with really light schoolwork, and I said it's October. I'm gonna watch a shitload of horror movies. I'm yeah, gonna watch a lot. I've I've never been into Giallo. I've seen uh, a Bay of Blood. That's the one I've seen. I believe it's called a Bay of Blood. Is that Argento or not Argento? I actually do not know because it might be. Hold on, because so I watched Inferno, was, and Inferno is a good one. So I think it is Dario Argento. Yeah, because that's the only Giallo director I, I mostly know. Yeah. No, no, Mario Bava. Mario That's Bava. Who that is. He directed Demon Two, right? That was him. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because he was. Yeah, I think he directed now, Demon Two. Now, technically, Suspiria is not really a classic giallo. You don't have the black gloved killer and yeah. all the hallmarks of it. But have you ever seen the original Suspiria? Yeah, I've seen the original. Suspiria. Beautiful movie. Yeah, definitely. Beautifully shot. I mean, it. It actually. I'm kicking myself for not seeing it earlier because I thought. Um, I always said like you know. The Shining was so ahead of its time with how it films, you know, how it kind of uh, shows color and, I don't know, how it uses color within a horror movie. And I kind of saw that, not done better, but just done first, obviously, in Suspiria. Both beautifully shot movies. Yeah. 
And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Oh no, he did not do Demon 2, I'm sorry. Is that what you said, Demon 2? Yeah, I thought it was Demons or Demons 2, yeah. Unless the title is in Italian here and I can't yeah. find it. Either way, though, I've seen a Bay, uh, bay of Blood. That's cool. But no, I um, I think... Was it Criterion that's got a whole bunch of Giallo movies? Yeah, they have a bunch of Giallo movies out right now nice. and stuff like that. Yeah, they have a bunch of horror movie classics and yeah. stuff, so it's going to be cool. It's badass. Definitely. Might watch a Hammer film if I have the time, Ooh, too. that's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, um, let's see. What else have I gotten into lately? Um, I've gotten into pop music. I'm like, I'm a sh- chaperone stand now. Is it popular Yes, music? yes, okay. popular music, TV. Okay. I'm a huge chaperone fan. I'm a stan. I don't know who that is, but I, I'm glad She's that you... pumping up the talks, TJ. I have heard of a Sabrina Carpenter. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's about all I know yeah. about modern pop, yes. movie, pop um, music, to be honest Besides with that, uh, I've become a record... I got a record player, so mm-hmm. I'm a cool guy now, and I own records. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. I saw you have the whole Smiths discography yes, now. Yes, that's how cool I am. That's pretty cool. I'm a cool guy, too. Yeah, although, it's definitely not behavior of someone who wants to get invited to things. That's true. But I'm a cool guy now. Cool guys talk like this. And they own records. And they listen to the Smiths. And they listen to the Smiths. This is cool guys. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, yeah, but wrestling happened. And a lot of wrestling happened. So mm-hmm. let's talk about AEW. Wrestle Dream happened. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, it was actually really good. Um, a lot of great matches. The ending, somewhat controversial. Um, so, Brian, uh, Brian Danielson lost uh, in a very quick way. Not quick way, I should say. The match lasted 27 minutes. But the ref stopped it as like really fast. We didn't expect the ending to be that fast. And um, John Moxley decided to murder Daniel Bynson, um, or Brian Danielson by uh, having his protege, Willie Utah, put a bat- paper a plastic bag over his head. And then they, uh, oh my God. they, uh, pil- pilmanized him with oh, his neck. Oh, with the chair, yeah. Yeah, nice. yeah. so uh, I think Brian Jameson's dead. Um, yeah, it's not good. It's a very sad ending. <laughs> if you saw it in wrestling, it probably happened. Yeah, yeah. it probably yeah. happened, yeah. It's very sad. Everybody was not happy. Like, because everyone wanted Brian Jameson to go on top, but I don't think even Brian Jameson wanted to go on top. It was just like, I'm, like, it's over. Like, this, <laughs> this. I'm gonna go down on my back just like every other wrestler has before me, and that's it. So, damn. Yeah, you think it's the end of him for real? Yeah, it's in his, it's his end of his long, like his full time one at least. You know, he may pop up once again, you know, in a while, but he's not gonna be on the road or stuff like that. Where does he rank in your mind among the pantheon of the greatest of all time? I think Brian Ranson. He may take the spot, like one of the spots in the on like the Mount Westmore. He might have taken a spot. Mm-hmm. Because, like, like if you ask any any wrestling fan, it's probably, like, Hulk Hogan, The Rock, Stone Cold, Ric Flair. Definitely mainstream, yeah. Mainstream, yeah. If you're going for, yeah, star power. For star sure. power. I think, like, I mean, I'm not, would I say I'm the biggest, like, Brian, Brian Danielson fanboy? No, I haven't watched, like, a lot of his matches and stuff. But he's definitely one of the greatest wrestlers who have ever done it. Like, he's up there with the Flairs. He's up there with the Hogan's. He's up there with the Rock. He's up there with mm-hmm. with the Stone Colds. Uh, it doesn't matter if he yeah. doesn't matter if he had reached like the popularity of they have, but he's definitely like one of them. You know, if you were to do a Mount Rushmore of technical wrestling, would he be on there? Yeah, he'd be the first one. Okay. I mean, there's a, the award is really him. It's the Daniel. It's the Daniel Bryanson technical wrestler of the year award. So yeah. Yeah, fair. That's him. Yeah. He also, I think, should be noted, although I haven't really followed him in AEW, that the guy was able to get so over in wwe which is the star brand right yeah you do have guys like like the rock and stone cold were good wrestlers yeah but not not technical masters like no rick hulk hogan far from it yeah i would say stone cold steve austin's probably the closest you're gonna get yeah he's damn talented yeah definitely he's definitely the most talented of the guys you mentioned i would say yeah but the fact that I mean, Brian Danielson made so much noise there that the WWE had to cave to fan pressure. Yeah. They had to. I mean, that can't be understated. True. That yeah. cannot be understated. So I was just curious because I always admired the hell out of him. I thought the yes movement was just something special. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought he actually, for being a smaller guy, was a very credible world champion in that yeah. in WWE. Yeah. And Team Hell No was a lot of fun. Yeah. I still have my shirt I mean, somewhere. he's the reason why, like, well, he's not one of the reasons. He's one of the reasons of, you know, I, the best moments I remember from, like, when I returned to watch wrestling in college 
was Kofi Mania, and he was champion during that time, and he would mm-hmm. face Kofi Kingston. Yeah. And he played the role perfectly because they just switched to WrestleMania, his WrestleMania. He, was just, he told Kofi Kingston, like, you're not championship material. And, of course, he didn't mean, like... Like what Triple H meant. Yeah, yeah, he didn't mean that, of course, <laughs> you know. But he meant, like, you'll be this wrestler. Like, he like he, like he was told when he was going for the world title. Now, did that have, not on purpose, some based undertone to it? Yeah, and like story, like he didn't mean it, but of course, like in storyline, like yeah, it's like a little bit. But yeah, there's no way you're gonna tell that story where a white yeah. guy. Yeah, I mean, there was there was definitely was like a waste of undertone, yeah. no matter what, like, even if they didn't want to or not. Like it was gonna be, but that was actually what made it better because it's yeah. like you know because there hadn't been a black world champion since The Rock, and and since Booker T in 2006, and you know and like, Kobe Kingston, but he was he was part of that, you know. Like I missed the I missed the yes movement I missed all that but I didn't miss this and like you see all these fans just like have this um, there's this response of just seeing Daniel Bryanson or Bryan Danielson no matter what he is called just like he gave it his all and the ref called it uh, maybe he called it too soon mm-hmm. but you know but then he just they just decided to end it you know just like they did the Ric Flair. Um, Ric Flair, uh, Terry Funk, just like a uh, plastic bag over the head, just to end him and pilmarized his head, you know. And it's Fucked just like, up. It's just like he went out in a stretcher, and that's it. And that's the end of Brian Anderson. And this is like, yeah, and like things are to get really interesting because like we don't know what's going on, who's controlling John Moxley, why is John Moxley doing this, you know. Hmm. You think there's a higher power? Maybe. And hopefully it's not Shane McMahon because people keep saying Shane McMahon. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, and like yeah, it was but, me, Brian. It was me, Brian. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, um, but like uh, the rest of the Dream Man event was great. Um, the whole card was really good. Um, my one of the other favorite matches was uh, Konosuke Tateska versus Will Ospreay and Ricochet. If you want to talk flippy shit, oh man, my God. that was that sounds shit. amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. It was fast paced, wow. hard hitting. Like I, I watched a review for it, um, and they. And the viewer, he said that Kenoshi Tester is like a perfect foil for Alspey and Ricochet. Because yeah. both those guys are fast and they usually use the speed instead of the power to defeat opponents. But he's also, he's very fast, but he also uses his power because he has a lot of strength in him. So it's just like, it was a perfect foil between the two. And he just, and he yeah. won the match and he's the new champion. Yeah, it does sound pretty damn great actually. Yeah. Um, YMA did great. Willow Nightingale was awesome. Um, you know, every match had a thing. Jack Perry versus uh, Sabata. It wasn't last longer, but that was more of a setup because Adam Cole came back, MGF came back. Nice. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, but you know, but I wish that lasted longer and didn't have the ending it did because it like, Shibata made Sabata look weak. But hopefully that gets corrected in the coming weeks and stuff. Um, the Young Bucks. The Young Bucks have kind of always stayed the welcome in the tag team division because if none of the tag teams are kind of over besides like them, FTR, and the Acclaimed. They're trying to do that now, but I feel like the tag team division's not going a lot anywhere right now because they're champions, because they're not, a lot, not on TV a lot, not really creating storylines and stuff like that. So they could have the they faced the private party, which um, they could have taken over the titles, but they didn't. So we'll see what happens for that. Um, Chris Jericho, people are tired of Chris Jericho, like really tired, that's like really, I'm, really tired. That's what Jericho. I've heard. So yeah, but um, but you know, but still, What's the Dream was great. Um, if you haven't checked it out, maybe I should do check it out. It'd be fun. Um, yeah, but I think that's mostly it. Um, yeah, that's our banter. Bad blood happened in WWE. Oh yeah, mm. that's it. Okay, this is not the end of our banter. I don't think any champ. Did they... I can't believe what they did to Braun Breaker. I mean, he lost his championship already. Yeah, that's kind of insane. Kind of I thought he was going to hold it for like six months or something. Yeah, it was weird. So he lost to Jay Uso on an episode of Raw, shook his hand after the match, and then the next week he speared, speared him after his title defense against uh, Chad Gable, I think it was. Yeah. I don't remember, but... I mean, things are kind of cooling off right now, or at least just in that... They're in that, you know... Uh, transition between SummerSlam and Survivor Series. Yeah. Uh, the main event of that Bad Blood was Cody Rhodes teaming with Roman Reigns, the original t- Tribal Chief, and they beat the New Bloodline. And of course, at the end of that match, they had the whole. Uh, should I like the New Bloodline like win a match though? I mean, to, to they prove... probably should. I mean, they yeah. did. They did get their win over Cody, KO, and Ar- and Randy Orton. So yeah, but that's not like. Then? I mean, you, you face Cody Rhodes, but like this is Tribal Chief. You gotta. Yeah, I mean. 
It's tough, though, because do you really want to have Roman lose his return? I mean, you have to have Cody eat the pin. Cody already yeah. eat the pin against in that six-man tag. It's kind of a no-win situation, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, this new tribal chief, the new uh, bloodline, obviously has no chance of being as over as it was with Roman. My only hope is that, I don't know, I, I pitched this before, at least if in my fantasy booking, Roman Reigns doesn't need the belt again. Yeah. Probably. I think just leave him out of the title picture, and he's kind of becoming exactly what I would have expected. That baby face where he can still be kind of a tweener, yeah. and he can still do the acknowledge me thing, but he's still love, beloved, and he can, I, you know what I mean? He can kind of be more more of a good guy, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. More of a Brock Lesnar type, a gatekeeper, I should say. I don't know. I don't know what the hell you do with him. Because, I mean, you don't want to discredit him by not ever giving him title opportunities, but you also don't want to discredit Cody Rhodes. I don't know how yeah. you can proceed, but he doesn't need the belt is all I'm getting. Yeah. At. So they're going. They're definitely doing the Rock versus Roman WrestleMania. My guess is going to be Rock versus yeah. Cody. Maybe Survivor Series? I don't know Like what they're going to do. If they know Rock I'm, takes the belt... Oh man, <laughs> he's probably gonna, it's gonna have be that. CM Punk all over again. <laughs> if Rock takes the belt, then I, I'll be a little upset. Yeah, especially because now he actually has a business interest in this. Yeah, and I just think that's even lamer. Mm-hmm. But you don't need this, dude. You don't need this. You are the the highest paid star in Hollywood or whatever. You're old, man. I mean, I guess I guess it's just how wrestling is. Though. Yeah, I mean, Hogan came back and got his belt from Triple H, who was red hot, you know, and then lost it the next month to Undertaker back in two thousand two and. Wacky shit happens. But yeah, it probably will be Roman Rock and Undertaker, right? Or at WrestleMania, rather. Yeah, definitely. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. I think... I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, so most likely, like, Cody Rhodes is going to face The Rock, maybe Survivor Series, maybe Royal Rumble. That's my guess. Could be. That would yeah. be straight up CM Punking. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. CM Punk uh, won the Hell in a Cell against Drew McIntyre, their rubber match. Yeah, it was, was way better than the uh, oh, street fight. Good. Yeah, so. It was good. Yeah. Man. yeah he didn't, he didn't kiss the uh, the uh, Prince of Base that was in Drew McIntyre's crotch. <laughs> no, he did not do yeah. that. They both wore crimson masks, which was. Uh, That's good. Yeah. Uh, there's a, there was a spot where they pulled out a toolbox and were literally like wrenching each other's skulls it was bizarre it was crazy yeah. and not bizarre it was it was just crazy to see in wwe uh especially uh nowadays but i do like that they're they're moving back into the tv 14 era type of thing well right? that's good because like that why we needed that kind of violence because like i compared last time we were on the show mm-hmm. we talked about how like like there were two like we had two blood feuds going on at the same time we had CM Punk versus Drew McIntyre, and then we had um, we had Adam Page versus uh, Swift Strickland. Oh boy! And Swift Strickland was <laughs> so much intensity; it was insane. Yeah. I mean, Adam Page burned down Swift Strickland's side at home, and they almost killed each other doing a unsanctioned steel cage match. You know. Now you there know. was definitely no blood drinking, but yeah, this. Yeah, was, definitely. Yeah. This was hardcore. And you know, people had the problems with that, even though, if from what you said, they also used screwdrivers to bash in their heads and stuff mm-hmm. like that, and they. They didn't use a screwdriver. Uh, Swift Strickland used a uh, little piece of wood that Hangman took from the burned down house and stabbed him in the head with it. Um, but you know, fucking wild, fucking wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, they, they definitely needed that because, like, you see yeah. that you saw like the, the brace, the, the fighting over a fucking brace. So like, yeah. no, like you guys are in a great blood blood feud. Just keep it going. Keep on having these great promo offs against each other. Drew McIntyre was doing amazing stuff. You know, mm-hmm. that's the thing. Like. You can be a star if you, if you have a great character and a great look and stuff like that, but you've got to deliver when it's time. And, mm-hmm. of course, CM Punk and Drew McIntyre can deliver. It's just, you know, I think the PG PG rating held them back. So, oh, sure, definitely. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you, like, for like that, you gotta you got to go all, uh, all out for that, you know? Yeah. And, and it, was, it was as tasteful as bleeding can get. I mean, it's not like it was... Again, it's not like it was vampiric like this world. Yeah. You know, that's a different level. And yeah. that's no, like, fine like, for Like uh, CM Punk sucked a needle into... None of that, no. Into Drew McIntyre's cheek. No, and then no, whacked no. him over the head with the steel chair. None of that, no. Yeah. Um, it was just... Because I'm still okay. It was well done. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. And again, I, that's fine for AEW. It was entertaining. But yeah. it's not for everybody, True. right? Uh, it's not going to... That wouldn't work for the WWE fandom. Right? True. And they did not because they revolted against it so hard. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Um... But no, it was a good it was a good end of the feud. It's just a shame somebody had to lose. 
Uh, but the, you know, Drew, for the most part, still looks okay because he could have won. But then his ego got the best of him. He pulled out a bag, which you think were with tacks, right? Yeah. When he emptied, it was just a bunch of beads, similar to the one on the bracelet. Going back to the beads. Just, I know. Just drop the bracelet. Just drop. I know. Well, that's the thing. He could have put Punk away, but he went and did that. Punk low-blowed him and then wrapped a chain around his knee and hit him with a go-to-sleep yeah. with the chain, you know. I never liked that spot when like wrestlers wrap like, something around. Because it always takes too long and doesn't look good. It, was, it happened pretty organically this time. It okay. actually worked better than most of the time it does. Yeah. And again, you do have to protect Drew because Drew's done such good work in this and he still should be in that upper crust. Yeah. Right? Um, so I think that they did a really good job with... with that was easily match of the night. And of yeah, course, definitely. they put it on first, but you had Roman in the yeah. main event. You, you couldn't do that one last, right? I guess not. But yeah, nothing, uh, nothing of note otherwise, yeah. as far as I know. Yeah. Where it got from this is that people should watch wrestling. Wrestling's fun, man. Yeah, it is, definitely. Like, even I just watch the PLEs, and then I, like, every Tuesday, I think I talked about this last time, I just look up Raw results while yeah. I'm on my break at work, and uh, every Monday I look up SmackDown results. Yeah. I should tell you, though, major news in the Japanese wrestling world, uh, Zack Sabre Jr., uh, one of the great technical wrestlers of our era, has won the New Japan Championship, uh, IWGP Heavyweight Champion. Cool. So now he's an IWGP Heavyweight Champion. He's one of the few foreigners to do that. So, well-deserved Zack Sabre Jr., one of the best technical wrestlers of all time. Uh, but definitely one of the just like, like just naughtiest sh- shits ever you've ever seen before. And he's just amazing. Oh, this guy looks punchable. Yeah, definitely. Wow, yeah. yeah. Holy shit. Cool. Yeah. I so love a good snivelly heel. Yeah. So, yeah. So, congratulations to him. If you ever hear this, Zack Sabre Jr. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. That would be amazing if Zack Sabre Jr. This really is really yeah, yeah. Cool. That would be amazing. Um, yeah, so that's the end of our banter time. Highway from the banter zone. <laughs> bow, bow, bow. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, I just threw a little curveball here. That's true, you. yes, okay. So, TJ, we have now f- commenced, finished with our banter. We must now go to our movie. TJ, what did we watch this week? We watched, uh, as one of your selections, this was called Pigs and Battleships. Yes, Pigs and Battleships, released in 1961, directed by Shohei Imamura. Imamura, Imamura, yeah. Imamura, and written by Hisashi Yamamochi, uh, starring Jizuku Yoshimura, Yoko Manamida, and Hiroko Hiroyuki Nagato. Once again, sorry, sorry I put you those names, but I probably did. Um, so yes, okay, so Pigs and Battleship, um, this is the one of the movies I have chosen. Um... So, like I said, when I chose Sohei Imamura, why I chose him, it was like, he was a director we've never heard of. He, we, like, we haven't really gone into any, mostly any foreign cinema, mostly a lot. I don't, we may have done one, I don't think so. Maybe the anime, we did, we did, um, Grave of the Fireflies. But besides that, not really a lot of foreign films, you know, we may have watched the British film here and there, but not really much. So I wanted to go, like, out of our comfort zone, like, so mm-hmm. far. Like, we have no idea who the director is. We're going to learn more about other worlds of cinema and stuff like that. And so that's why I chose... I actually chose this film because a famous um, podcaster, his name is Chris Fyan. He does the Ringer shows and stuff like that. Um, big Picture. Um, he watched this film and I saw it. I was like, Pigs and Battleship. So he was the inspiration of me choosing Shohei Imamura. I was like, I don't know this guy. Like, I should choose him. Because, yeah. So he watched Pigs and Battleships, gave it like three and a half stars and... I'm glad I like watched it, of course, because we'll get into that more later. But yeah, that's the reason I ch- I chose it. Um, yeah. So TJ, like, what? You could you probably never heard of this before before I introduced it to you. So what were your expectations of the film just by looking at it, or just like anything, or just by hearing? Uh, I figured it would be a wartime drama. Yeah. Uh, knowing that it was a Japanese movie and that the director, because we did watch one of his previous movies, so we went over his like prime he you know he was a young adult when world war ii was happening yeah right i believe yeah we'll get into um, his background while making this movie yeah, a little born bit too. In 26 so I, th- I figured it'd be set during the war and probably like a war drama like from and i thought oh that's kind of interesting to see a world war ii drama set from the japanese side or the the access side or whatever uh, but otherwise i had no expectations yeah Definitely. I kept calling it pigs in battleships. That's why I made the <laughs> joke last time. Uh, Is it like pigs and blankets? And then I saw it's pigs and battleships, and I said, "Wow, you sounded like a fucking idiot." Yes, you did. Yeah, yes, you but did. Uh, no, I didn't know anything else about it. Um, mm-hmm. I liked. I did like Vengeance is Mine. That's true. For the most part, it was it was a, 
a little. No, I'm not gonna say it's uneven or clunky. It's just I think it may it's made with different filmmaking sense. Yeah, than we're I felt used like to. I don't know, like 19. It felt like definitely. I think I think was. I forget what year Avengers is in mind. I think it was like in 1970s, to yeah. be exact. But yeah, it doesn't felt like a 1970s film because this one is completely different. This one's much different. Much different. But I will say, I will not forget a lot about Vengeance is Mine. That movie was just bizarre. Yeah. And again, it was handled so much. Like that same story, if told if told through an American movie, would have been just told so much differently. True. And that's nothing new. You watch like the ring, the Japanese version of The Ring or yeah. The Grudge, it's obviously told differently than the American version. But that one was just jarring. But I did overall like it. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But, but I had, yeah, otherwise I had yeah. no expectations. Yeah, okay, so we're talking about Pigs and Battleship, but we don't know what it's about, TJ. What's what's Pigs and Battleships about? Set in an American-occupied post-World War II Japan, Pigs and Battleships tells the story of Kinta, a young man desperate to prove himself and to be a big shot. He joins up with the local Yakuza, who put him in charge of the gang's pork distribution, an allegiance which worries his pregnant girlfriend Haruko. Kinta's rationale? He refuses to be a wage slave like his fisherman father. So dire is the local economy, in fact, that Kinta even agrees to be the fall guy, if necessary, should a murder committed by his uh, Yakuza's big boss be discovered by law enforcement. Subsequently, the gang tasks one of its members with burying the body on their pig farm. During a later celebration, they cook one of the pigs and, mid-meal, the gangster reveals that he was too lazy to bury the body, so he instead ground it up and put it in the pig feed. This has no actual bearing on the movie's plot, but it was disgusting, it was revolting, and I wanted to share it. Haruko, meanwhile, upset by Kinta's increasing loyalty to the Yakuza, uh, parties with a group of American sailors one night. Upon going back to a hotel room with the three of them, however, she regrets the decision, and her attempts to leave are violently thwarted by the Navy men, who also rape her. Upon failing to rob them afterward, she is returned to her family by law enforcement, and she decides to honor her mother's wish that she become the mistress of a wealthy American. Elsewhere, the local Yakuza is crumbling inter internally, and the gang assigns Kinta the task of loading the remaining pigs onto trucks for transport and sale. On the eve of his last job, a despondent Kinta and Haruko reunite and reaffirm their love for one another. Kinta promises that after this final job, the two of them will run away together and start a new life. Of course, as all last jobs in movies go, the plan goes haywire when Himori, his local Yakuza's big boss, arrives at the pig transport and informs Kinta that he's needed to take the fall for the previous murder after all. Kinta refuses, enraging Himori, who orders him beaten and loaded onto a truck with the pigs. Once in tow, Kinta finds an automatic rifle in the back of the truck, and he ultimately uses it in an attempt to escape from both the gangsters and law enforcement. In the ensuing madness, sadly, Kinta succumbs to a previous gunshot wound and dies. An enraged and heartbroken Haruko watches as his body is stretchered away by medics, and she curses him for getting involved with the gang for one final time. Shortly thereafter, Haruko and a group of similarly attractive young Japanese women await an aircraft carrier of American soldiers. Upon their arrival, however, Haruko, not content with being a GI's handmaiden, leaves via a nearby train. In the end, some hilarity ensues. Thank you, TJ, for that well crafted. I hope I read it right, because yeah. sometimes I was a little confused during this movie. There was also a subplot about Quinta's immediate boss yeah. thinking that he has cancer. Yes. And that actually is an admittedly funny part of the movie. Yeah. He thought he had cancer, and he can't bring himself to kill himself, so he pays another gangster to kill him at some undisclosed time in the future. Yeah, but he didn't do it because it was kind of fit money, so... It was counter... Well, yeah, he later finds out that he has an ulcer, and before he can call off the hit on himself, he freaks out when he sees the guy. Uh, he thinks he's about to get killed and runs away. There was a little humor to be found in that. We'll talk about yeah. that, though. So, okay, so another reason why I chose this film is because I thought, okay, I can't do another drama. I looked on Wikipedia. They said this was a comedy. I'm like, okay, this is a comedy. So I'm like, okay, so we choose one comedy... And just, it kind of is a comedy, because this is not in, like, the ha-ha way, but more the outrageous kind of way. Because you think about it, it is kind of outrageous. It's a, a story about gangsters who, instead of doing drugs, they deal pigs. Yeah. You know? The boss thinks like, he's going to die of stomach cancer, so he hires a hitman to kill him. But he just goes around the whole movie just trying to off himself, because he thinks he's going to die. <laughs> um, the best of which was when he tries jump when he 
threatens him to throw himself in front of a train, right? Yeah. And he can't do it. And it turns out what he was holding on to was an advertisement. I wrote this down. For Nissan Life Insurance. Yes. And the slogan was, live life with a smile. <laughs> that made I me that laugh. Yeah, great. that was great. Yeah. That was funny. Yeah. The thing about the gangsters, I don't know, they did kill a man, but... They're really, they're not like really tough, intimidating, yeah. tough guys. They're just like neighborhood buffoons and absolutely like, and nuts and nut n- nutballs who just like became gangsters. The thing with Unfortunately, Emma is that he wants to show the goody side of Japan. You know, people always see like the very prideful, very like upstanding side of Japan and in, in cinema and stuff like that. But he wants to show like the real Japan, the dirty Japan, and this is definitely a prime example of this. He shows, you know, what happened like during occupy occupation of japan doing after world war ii um or during the like the 1960s because my guess is there was a that was probably like a base town and you know they they soldiers are still coming by no matter what so mm-hmm. if i is set in 1961 and you know just keep on soldiers just keep on coming so there's they're trying to get them to seek with any prostitute they can for money maybe steal from them no matter what you know because they're just trying to make a quick dime off them well, and what's interesting, too, is when you see the Japanese side of it, you know, I always think of, like, the Bushido code or whatever that Japanese soldiers always fought under. Like, you know, we're always taught, especially post-Oppenheimer, uh, that the reason that was necessary was because there was no stopping the Japanese army. They were just going to keep fighting. That was their, you know, that was it. You you died. It was an honor to die for the emperor, right? Yeah. And to see maybe the ramifications of them actually having to surrender something that japanese yeah. plus populace... the u.s influence because we were over there for like six years you know yeah is that when this takes place do you know offhand so okay so i looked it up because i read a review of it and he, the guy said like the 16th year of like u.s occupancy in japan like we were there for 16 years and then uh-huh. i found it so we were there for seven years after world war ii um from 1945 to 1952 so that was the occupation my guess is this is this, is t- this movie is taking place in 1960 you know, my guess is it's like a base town, you know, like, mm-hmm. it's, you know, like the Navy, like U.S. Naval, Navy still goes there sometimes, you know, just to drop off and release some steam or something like that, you know, something like that. Really? So, yeah, but, you know, I think this is definitely like an influence of, like, one, our influence on on Japan, the World War II effect, what you said, definitely, because, you know, when we watch Beer with the Fireflies, you know, when um the young boy in it, like, he's like, no way, like, the mighty... Japanese military would never give up, and then the guy right. just pushed them off. A level of disillusionment. Disillusionment, because yeah, having to live with that for seven years or whatever, that would be yeah. Because think about we terrible. yeah, okay, we bombed them. They my my guess the town they were in wasn't Nagasaki or Hiroshima. You know, it wasn't like that in this movie, but you know, like he definitely affected their economy. I mean, it was definitely a stress, and this is like their national identity. National identity, yeah. yeah. But definitely just shows like no, there was a different side to Japan that we we think of, you know. Mm-hmm. But that's what that's a uh, Imoa wants. He wants to show like the real the real side of Japan, you know. Yeah. Like what is the opposite of we did in the fifties? Like, in the fifties, you remember like there was like the Hays Code, nineteen forty and fifties. There was Hays Code. Show America in this like bountiful light where we're all patriotic, we're all do gooders, we're all swell people, we're all dang chucks, Mister. You know, like we drink cherry sodas and. Go to hopscotch or whatever the fuck it was called. It's like, but she, but Imamura Imo, Imo was like, no, I'm gonna show like the real Japan. This is gonna be the real Japan. It's not gonna be like, like um, like there's a guy named Ozu. He would make period pieces back then. He made Tokyo Story, which should have won the greatest films of all time. It would show like a very honorable family. You know, they, uh, you know, the women cook, the men work. You know, it's like it'd be like us. But I'm not saying it was a bad thing, of course. But he would show. Um, he was like, like what people, what we characterize as Japanese culture, definitely. But Imo was like, okay, yeah, there's that Japanese culture, but there's also something else going on, you know? Because he wants to show all sides of Japan. Like, he wanted to show the real underbelly of it all. Oh, sure. Yeah. And you're always going to have some kind of organized crime, no matter what. Yeah. You know, even if, and that's, you know, it's, you mentioned how silly and absurd it is that it's pig smuggling. But I think a lot of times, like, Whatever it is, that you know, if there's a buck to be made, organized. Well, yeah, crime if, I, will... if you think about it, like it was post-war Japan. Um, my guess, meat was still hard to come by. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm, I'm guessing. Um, so it's like, yeah, pigs make a lot more sense because there's a lot of money in meat. People want. That's what somebody wants. It's not really illegal, I, I'm guessing. So depends. Just... I mean, maybe they're stealing the pigs or whatever. Yeah, some, but, yeah, yeah. But no, the the whole point is, you know, we think of organized crime and we think about the 
the violent side of it. And obviously there is a violent side of this, but as silly as pig smuggling sounds, if there's a buck to be made, organized crime, if they can do it, they'll do it. That's yeah. that's the whole point. Yeah. Um, I think like, you know how Scorsese shows like, when, like mobsters, he shows like the fun side. Everybody loves the fun side. But then he shows like the dark side and everybody just forgets about that and just focuses on that. But Imo, Imo was just like, no, I'm just gonna show the idiots. They're not really smart. Yeah. Um, it's kind of stupid what they do. Um, you know, it's just like, well, and he shows how they indoctrinate people too. Yeah, young influenceable yeah. people. Yeah. So uh, Shohei, the way he reached us for this film, he actually was a black market hustler post war. Nice. I don't know what exactly he did or what he what he hustled, but he was. Uh, he would actually hang out with gangsters in the streets and just hang out with them to see what they were doing, you know. And like they would, the gangsters would make fun of him because he was working hard but not earning enough money. So that goes into like the sense of pride that these people have for their work because. They're, they're like they are like the pirates of this of the century you know they're like you know they're just like having freedom to do whatever they want they're drinking they're smoking they're having sex with women no matter what they're just doing what they want to do and that's the idea of freedom and that's yeah. like something that maybe was a plus during the Japanese reign of World War two I'm once again we're not really history majors on this but yeah but so it's like we have freedom we can drink whatever we want we can have we can have sex with whatever we want we can smoke we can get money quicker than anybody else by doing these things and not having to work hard at all yeah you're you know, not paying was, taxes on yeah it. exactly yeah. you have this pie that yeah i'm beating the system i'm my own man you know yeah yeah in other ways that yeah, that's the way they they see it and that's that that's their pride in it and that's why that's why kinta is probably like this and we're wondering like how come kinta's just not quitting like his does life shit like he has this pie, like well. Like, plus, he also sees, and it's kind of a universal um, aspect of his character. He sees his dad as a fisherman. He's been yeah. a working class. You know, he doesn't have much, and he works every single day, but has very little to actually show for it. Yeah. But he has pride knowing that he's not, you know, he's not owned by anybody else. That's the funny thing. Quinta calls his dad a wage slave. But really, Quinta's the one that's owned, so to speak, by somebody else. Yeah. Right? He's the one that, whether he knows it or not, he's being brainwashed, essentially, saying, hey, you know, we're kind of like your family now. And, uh, you know, hey, the boss lost his temper. If you take the fall for him, we'll say it's self-defense. It's your first defense. Two years, two and a half years yeah. you'll do. That's it. And he's really the one that's selling his freedom. Yeah, if you look at it, it reminds me of like those uh, stock bros. It's like, okay, I invested twenty five million in this one stock. It's gonna hit bro. It's gonna, you know what? I'm gonna spend all this money. It's good, man. It's got it. And then like, you know, shit hits the fan, and then they're broke, and it's like, fuck. Yeah, that's well, what it definitely parallels to there. Yeah, right? definitely to that type of mindset as well. Yeah. So the character of Kenta, he's definitely somewhat low. You can see why. Uh, what's the name of the main of the female character? Hinako. Haruko. Haruko. You can see why. Like, he has some charm to him. I understand why he fell for, why she fell for him, but, you know, it's definitely a different situation where the guy, he's not going to grow up, and, like, Hoko should have probably left him a long time ago, but she doesn't really have any options. I mean, it's just, like, until, like, the very end, at least, because, like, she, she, the, she works in a brothel, and she doesn't work in a brothel, I should say, but she works, she works in a small-time restaurant. Her mother, like you said... Just like, why don't you just pimp yourself out to the Americans? Just like, just marry him, become his subservient wife mm -hmm. forever, and like, you'll be set for life. But of course, she doesn't want that. I mean, who really wants that? I mean, it's a, basically, you're just a subservient to a man all your life. Like, no, she wants, she wants to have an equal partnership, which she thinks she can see that with a. Uh, with Kinta, yeah. With Kinta, yes. Yeah, no, she wants to be independent, really, yeah. which kind of maybe flies in the face you know it's kind of a uh financial security versus you know agency versus i'm my own person yeah whatever my circumstances are and how you know how affluently i can afford to live at least i am my own person and again that's kind of even a parallel with quinta's dad yeah he's got to work his ass off all his life to pay the bills but at least again he he is who he is. Quinta, I get the sense, doesn't know who he is. He's, yeah. a, he's basically a child, right? He's influenced by these bad guys to do bad things, ultimately. And uh, it costs him the, the yeah. Uh, yeah. you know... Which is kind of a tale, I mean, like, like, you think about, like, us growing up in America. I mean, we don't have any really experience with this, because we grew up middle class, and we never really had to do... We, we did work for our money. I'm not going to say, like, we were just given everything, but... 
All Lives are definitely easier compared to Kenta and stuff like that. Yeah. But if you compare it to like any like think about inner city film in the nineties or you know, what we always think of inner city, you know. People who come up from poor areas, they a lot of them do crime because it's faster, you know. And you get like more respect. I mean, you know, you always would read like reason why people become gangsters or pimps or anything like that because they got respect in the neighborhood. They got the money. As Wu Tang says, cash rule everything's around me. Queen gets the money, tell all the bill, y'all. That's so, right. That's true, yeah, because they realize they got the money, they got the power, mm-hmm. you know, and that's why a lot of people want to become gangsters and become drug dealers because yeah. they didn't have to slave at a dead end job for 20 years dealing with some asshole boss, you know. They get the money now, they get the respect now, mm-hmm. and get, they get whatever they want now. So, like, you can tell that parallel between, like, U.S. and, you know, Japan, like, uh, inner city or, like, very poor situations. Hey, there sometimes seems like a, to be, there's a fine line between illegitimate businessmen and legitimate yeah. businessmen, right? I mean, like you said, it's definitely the appeal of being your own person and making your own money, setting your own hours, and again, not paying taxes. You know, it is... I, I would also argue that there is a real social aspect to... And it, it goes to any gang. Joining any gang is... You know, we... I think we're social creatures, right? To some yeah. degree... To some degree, even the most introverted person wants to be accepted into some group. It could be yeah. like a, Reddit, a Reddit group, a Facebook group. It could be whatever, a work friendship thing. To some degree, though, everybody wants to feel like they belong somewhere. And I do think that, you know, Crips, Bloods, the yeah. Purple Gang, there is a big aspect of it that it's like, you know... We're going to make you feel like you're one of us. Yeah. Look at the beginning of Goodfellas. He's a kid, and they got him parking these fancy cars, and they're appealing to his, you know, uh, you know, he's watching his dad, a mailman, right? As a, It's kind of a similar story, you know, yeah. I think about it. He, his dad's a wage slave, and instead he's going to go work with these mobsters and make BOGO dollars and be a part of that family. Yeah. Not his biological family, but a family that takes care of him, quote-unquote. Mm-hmm. There's a social aspect to it. And Quinta, I get the sense, doesn't know who he is. He has this woman who's crazy for him for some ungodly yeah. reason. She got they got pregnant, she had the abortion, and then like but she's willing to start a family with him. Like yeah. it shows that. Like And all he'd have to do is be a working class, just yeah. find something steady. Yeah. Something legitimate. But of course that goes in like any like, you know, father son relationship. Like you don't want to be your father because mm-hmm. you know, because I don't know, like, like, like Henry Hill, because you see this guy, he, like, he worked all his life, what do you got for you? He, he lives in a shack down by the, by the, by the beach, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, but you see, you see the, the top gangster, the guy who thinks he's going to die of cancer, you know? He lives in an apartment, he has a nice woman, you know? Yeah. He has a good life, you know? I mean, he's an idiot who thinks he's going to die of stomach cancer, but still. <laughs> okay, yeah. I think, I think what it boils down to is we're all products of our environment and our formative years right yeah you know i had this conversation with my mom and i'm not going to be i'm not going to get political here but she's very into this election and she says i don't understand why why younger people are so flippant about politics and i say mom because think about it if you're a first-time voter you're just 18 now what were your formative years i mean mine were the george w bush years if you grew up you know someone growing up someone growing up during the 60s or 70s or 80s will have a far different outlook than somebody that grew up post 9-11, right? Yeah. Just economic factors are so much differently. If you grew up as a, in, in your youngest, most formative years were the, the economic collapse, you're going to have a different outlook on things, especially when, you know, coupled with the internet and social media and just people communicate differently now. Yeah. And I said it's just a cultural difference. If Quinta is, what do you think, 20 in this movie? I guess 20, 22, something like that, 21. You know, if your formative years are those disillusioned ones where you're like, oh, yeah, the, the man, the government gave up on this, you know, why should I respect any establishment? Yeah. Then it makes perfect sense why he's, like, you know, rejecting the traditional way of life, the working and yeah, being an just honest going to it, just going, working correct. at a factory, you know, yeah. Correct. Yeah. So I think that's really what it boils down to. He's a product of his environment, and he's also probably just a little naturally immature as well. Some people are. Yeah, true. I know I am. Yeah, but um, yeah. So yeah, we see that in the Kinta character. Um, let's see. We do have. There's this, I did find one character interesting. That's um the the head gangster's brother, who definitely lives a very straight life. You know, when he visited in the hospital. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So he lives a normal life, and he seems very happy. And, 
like well adjusted and it's like yeah i work for a living but i don't have to deal with this shit mm-hmm. i don't have to deal with uh like like pigs you know i don't do you know i don't have to deal with trying to almost getting murdered or something like that mm-hmm. or getting murdered like, you know so, yeah. yeah yeah i think that's so that a- shows like the opposite side of what kinta could have like sure you could live a boring life but he'll have protection and he'll have like he could be happy with with his girlfriend I think it's all, almost like uh, you have to reset your perspective from time to time. Money is not everything. Yeah. Money is not something that you can take with you when you go. And sometimes just the peace of mind that comes with not having to look over your shoulder the rest of your life because you've joined a gang. Yeah. Sometimes that's invaluable. That's how I'd look at it. Yeah. And uh, I think that's kind of what that character is meant to do is show what Quinta could be if he just yeah straightened up now and just kind of reevaluated his outlook on things. Nobody wants to work for a living. Yeah. Nobody. But that's where that's where you find happiness in what you can control. Yeah. Definitely. That's my advice anyway. Definitely. Or my look on it. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the, the comedy aspect of this. Because mm-hmm. once again, in like Wikipedia, it it is a comedy. So um this is definitely a melody. We could edit it. We can edit it? We could we, edit we it. We could edit it. That's true. We want. could edit it right now. That is true. Yeah. But it's definitely, uh, this is a me- war, me- post-war melodrama. Um, it's now a kaiju film. Oh, really? Okay, so yeah. it's now a kaiju film. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a, a post-war melodrama mixed with absurd ideas. Cause, so in the original plan, uh, Shohei wanted 1,500 pigs. He only got 400 because of budget issues. So if you think about it, because like, the climax of this film, it's, it's insane. It's, he got beaten up by the gangsters that tricked him into giving him the pigs. And now he's, he's begging for his life because they're like, you can still... Cause, once again, it's also funny because the, the gangsters made a deal with each other. They're like, we'll split it 60-40. And I was like, okay, but he's still got to go. Yeah. And so he's just like, you got to take the fall or they're going to kill him. And Kinta's just like, I had enough of this. And he tries to shoot the gun, but he can't do it. Like, this is not like a, like a manly moment, like a moment. Like, this is the moment he realizes, like, I'm not going to become a, I'm not gonna become a stepping stone anymore. But it's not, like, in a great way. Like, he's not, like, beating up the guys, like, right away or anything like that. He's yeah. trying to shoot a gun. He doesn't know how to work it. He's not Tony Montana. He's not Tony Montana. He's just, he's trying to work it. He, he throws it on the ground. It goes off everywhere. That was funny. Yeah. Especially when they realize, hey, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. And they slowly start yeah. creeping toward him. And but he's still, he's still got the gun. It's like, yeah. And he finds out how to work it somewhat. But he still can't handle it. Mm-hmm. So he's just firing everywhere. He's just shooting down downtown. I think that the humor in this movie actually was pretty appropriate and it's a type of humor like you alluded to earlier it's not a laugh out loud thing it's not a joke fest by any means no. it's kind of humor that would be found in real life if these situations were happening like if an immature young kid got you know mixed up with this gang and then like he you know he's totally not violent by nature and then he's trying to get away first time he's ever holding a gun and he can't figure it out yeah that is something that i could see happening yeah. in a real situation and it actually works yeah it's pretty funny and because of the pigs it's, that's what makes it more hilarious it's absurd i'm yeah. so like, huge like his major his like major moment his major like triumph is like i'm gonna release all these pigs onto the street mm-hmm. and he does that he leaves 400 pigs onto the street and what happens to the bad guys they got they got Trampled. They got trampled by pigs. Yeah, that's how. That's yeah. They was every, they were running away from pigs. I'm like, why are they running away from these pigs? Can't they just like step over them or something? No, I guess these pigs have a vendetta against these guys. I guess so. So they're, just, they're going to scratch their eyes out. It's, <laughs> it's like um like when the boat's filling with water and like you're trying to get away from sharks or something, mm-hmm. and like the floor is lava, but they <laughs> they couldn't do it, so they collapsed and the pigs just got them. Yeah, it was. And it was fun. like this is ridiculous. And then you know. It just shows, like, these guys are not smart, they're stupid, and Kenta should just give up, but he doesn't realize that, because he still sees them as... That's the moment, he, I think that's the moment he realizes that they're stupid. That these yeah. guys aren't smart. The guy who you looked up to, the man who you wanted to be, thinks he's dying, but he's not dying. He stole the wrong... You stole the wrong x-ray for him, and he went to three doctors, and he said you only have three days, and he just kept on running... He always tried to kill himself. He got he was too coward to do that. But I, I shouldn't say too coward to do that. But he was too afraid to do that. He hired a guy. He gave him counterfeit money, and he still thinks he's gonna die. You know, it's just like it shows that these guys aren't smart at all. No, it's absurd yet still very human. Yeah, uh, comedy in that like 
when shit hits the fans and the plan breaks down, all these gangsters, like you said, they turn on one another. Turn on one another, or they're like, they'll, they'll side with each other, and they'll just be like, okay. So they make, just... like, it's always sunny type of, uh, yeah. of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, allegiances. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, they'll team up, but it, you know that it's not something that's going to last. It's very, imma- they all come off as stupid and immature. Yeah, like the, silly. Who was the, it was one guy in the bar who, um, he wore glasses People didn't look. I think he was a Chinese man. I think that's why people didn't like him. Yeah. But he, I think, I think he had like like a lot of influence. Was he money. a different mob boss? I think he was a different person. Like a real, like legitimate mob yeah, boss. Yeah, like or real something? guy. I think. Yeah. I believe so. If we but if we watch the film correctly, um, or read the film correctly, uh, but he was just like these guys are idiots. Like they're stupid. Yeah. Like they're gonna spend so much money on feed and stuff like that. They're not gonna make any money. Like he already knows this. Yeah. But he'll. It'll help him out. I don't know because maybe he finds it. I don't know because he feels like it's gonna be something out of me. You know, he's gonna get like a million dollars because he's gonna help these guys. Mm-hmm. But he's not. Well, he's like, an actual illegitimate businessman. Yeah, like, he's an actual competent gangster. Yeah, right. That that I think is is humorous. Yeah. Um, I mean, hell, you look at the guy who was supposed to bury the pig, and he straight he up says, "I was too lazy to," so I yeah. just boiled the the body and put it in the pig feed. And While they're all eating the pig. Yeah, they're all eating a pig. And the- oh god, that was so gross. That was so gross. But that was funny. I mean, like, yeah. And the fact that they don't, they, they don't immediately murder this guy. Yeah. Shows that these guys are not Martin Scorsese gangsters. These guys are buffoons. Yeah. Who are admittedly trying to make the best of a bad economy, but are just not uh, competent enough to do it, um, you know, well. Nor are they uh, interested in being. You know, doing it legitimately, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, I, th- I thought the humor, I didn't have an issue with it. No, you? no, definitely. I, I, just, want, I just want to talk about it because, sure. like, you think of it as a comedy, but this is definitely a drama. It's about yeah. two souls who want to be together, but one's too immature to realize that he should just stop what he's doing and be with the woman he loves. And Tell you that, I guess, I, it's funny, I didn't think of it as a comedy. I knew there were comedic elements. Yeah. I'm saying it's a comedy because on the website they say comedy. So it's just like, you would think like, with, like but really it's more absurdity than, than ha ha. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I was almost going to compare it to Goodfellas because there are scenes in Goodfellas, just because we've been talking about Scorsese, there are scenes in Goodfellas that genuinely make me laugh, yeah. at least the first half of the movie. Um, or like Boogie Nights or something yeah. like that. Would you call Boogie Nights a comedy? No, but it definitely has like humorous moments mm-hmm. in it. And this is definitely, it's kind of like those movies. Kind of like that. The only thing that I think might push it toward comedy is the boss's ulcer mix-up. Yeah. And just him literally trying to kill him. It is so absurdist. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. It really walks a the line there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But I, I did like the comedic elements. Yeah, actually. I did. Definitely. And the dramatic elements were great too. I mean... It's just, it's sad that like, he died, like, Kenta died, and he's not going to be able to... After he finally matured, after he finally, finally matured, got it. But, you know, but maybe we should just, we all see that it's coming, because it's like, I think, like, ever seen Menace to Society? Mm-hmm. Ever seen that? Okay, so, in the movie, the main character, he's, he's too far deep, he's done too much shit, and he's about to live a good life. He's going to go out with the girl he loves, with his, her son, go to Atlanta, find a job, Get away from all this this gangster shit, you know. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, he he's he's too deep in, and he got yeah, as you know, as spoilers for *Men Society*, he got shot. Yeah, yeah, he got taken down in the drive by because he fucked up too much. He impregnated a girl, and I don't know who the like the brother decided. Hey, I'm gonna kill this guy instead of like force him to raise the child. So the child doesn't have a kid, so he's stupid too. So it's just like it's just like everybody just it's fucked up. So yeah. no matter what, so like. Like the main character in society, Kenta, he's too far deep. Like, he got his revenge, I guess, on everybody. But on the outcome of that revenge, he got shot, and he was just—he died in a toilet. He died the way Elvis Presley died. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he did. Uh, no, you're and you're absolutely right. He played like, the fool, and he died a fool's death. It's probably because it's the year 2024, and anytime you hear two characters say, "You know what? This is my last job, and then I'm gonna go straight," yeah. you know how it's gonna go. Yeah. And it is genuinely sad at that point um, because she finally reached him. She finally got through to him. He finally realized that this is not a life to live. That The mafia terrifies me. Organized crime terrifies yeah. me because, like, yeah, you can make good money, but once you're in, you're in. Yeah. And there's no getting out. No. They say there's, like, two ways out, right? Either jail or you're going to end up dead. You don't really retire. Yeah. 
So, yeah, it, I, I did. It was predictable that he was going to die or at least face some grave danger. Um, sucked when it happened. What did you think of her cursing at him as he was stretchered out? I don't know. Maybe he deserved it. Like Probably. it's so. It's just like it's heartbreaking because like she finally got a chance out and. We think, like, oh, she's just going to end up with the American guy now. Like, that's, like, usually what happens, my guess. Like, the man you love died, and now there's no other way to get out. So, because you were going to go to, uh, I forgot where, Kurosawa or somewhere? And not Kurosawa, that's the director of... <laughs> yeah, director of, not Kurosawa. Not Kurosawa, but you are going to go somewhere else in Japan. And your uncle was going to hook you up with a job, you're going to live a nice, comfortable life. Kawasaki. But, Kawasaki, yes. Go to Kawasaki, work in a factory, live a nice, comfortable life, and... You know, that's gone for her now. It's like the end of Chinatown, you know? Like when um, the bad guy takes the, the, his daughter or her, her, his niece, I forget. Mm, it's like, both, yeah, both, it's yeah. like, that's the end now. Like, she's going to be uh, sexually abused by this man. Yeah. That. Like, and you think that, yeah, now she's just going to have to marry an American. She's going to be a subservient wife for the rest of her life, you know? Yeah. Not be in love with this guy and just, like, you know, just be what his mom wants. But luckily, she had her own moment and she, was just, she said, fuck this. I'm going to go to where my uncle is and get that job and live my own life. And she stands defiant of what everybody else was doing. Because the, the last scene where she's walking towards the train station and all the girls are coming in, you can see like she's going in the opposite direction. Literally and figuratively. Like, she's going in the opposite direction of what everybody wants, of what, every, or what society thinks Japanese women should be. You know, mm -hmm. It's like, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to go out and, and be, live my own life. Yeah. Yeah. Which is great, because, you know, it's just like, um, what's her name? How you call? Haruko. Haruko. Her, like, her role in the film is definitely this, like, like uh, girlfriend who can't catch a break, you know? Definitely, like, when she tried to, she can't convince her boyfriend. When she, when she put, when she got pissed off, she was like, fuck it, I'm gonna have fun. Because I've never, she was never allowed to have fun. She always had to work and do that oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. And unfortunately, the, the circumstances, like, it, after she tried to have fun, it was just terrible. She got raped by three U.S. sailors who just kept on singing stupid songs all the time. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they were joking and laughing about it in the yeah. shower. Yeah, and now she's like, she keeps on thinking, like, oh, I'm just stuck in this life. Like, I got to get out of here. Like, she tried to rob the, per rob the sailors. It didn't work out. And she's still stuck. But... She had that last bit of hope, but, you know, but somehow she still, like, got the guts inside her to just be like, fuck this, I'm still mm -hmm. gonna go, because mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm not gonna be a servant to this man anymore, like, I'm not gonna be who everybody, th who, what society thinks I will be, just a puppet for sex, and, and to be cook, and be a cook, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a story of agency and characters that want to think they have it. Kinto likes to, Kinto likes to think that he has it, but he's actually indebted in a way, or just tied to this mob um haruko does not want to just be some subservient yeah. housewife or mistress or what yeah have you. and she's indebted to her mother because like you know it's your mother no matter yeah. what so you're gonna even if she takes all your money every time you work or anything like that because when you're family so you yeah. can't turn your back family but you know i don't think her family really cared about her at all just like well i'm you know what i'd probably just say that in such desperate times you just I don't know if it's lack of caring or if it's just that was so normalized. It's just, you know, selling out to the rich Americans. If that was so normalized just for survival purposes, yeah. I don't know. I, yeah, it's it's sad, obviously, if that's the reality. But that that's my read. It's just, it's just a bunch of characters who want to be in charge of themselves and their lives, even though the circumstances in which they live don't allow it. Quinta's dad, he has to work. He has to be a quote-unquote wage slave. Yeah. But even then, I'd argue he's got more agency than Quinta does. True. It's, um, that's the main theme I take from this movie. And that with the end, you don't really know what her comes next for her. And yeah. I don't think that she even really knows what comes True. next for but her. But she's going to be her own woman. That's and right. And she's going to do what she needs that's to do. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly and the, right. And the freedom that she wants. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I don't think we have to... I don't know. I think we basically covered the whole film. You know, we, have to go, we don't have to go by beat by beat. But we covered the yeah. main themes of everything. Um, let's see. Oh, we didn't even go with the direction of this film. This film was shot beautifully. Mm -hmm. Way better than Vengeance's Mind. Vengeance's Mind felt really... Well, it didn't feel cheap, but it definitely felt like 1970s by me this like, cinema. Yeah. Yeah. I can definitely tell that. And it was just like... Well... Okay, so the production had many issues. Um, uh, Shohei went over time, over budget. And the studio, uh, Nikashu, uh, banned him 
or two years from directing. He mostly just wrote screenplays. But um, I believe he had a film, he filmed it like the studio system in Hollywood, you know, um, in CinemaScope or something like that. And you can definitely tell, this film looks gorgeous. It does it look great. Yeah. yeah. Especially even in, the black and white doesn't even take anything away from no, it. No, it doesn't, no. Yeah. And the streets, look, like the set designs look amazing. I love the, the dirtiness, how it looks. And like, you can definitely tell like, yeah, this is a cheapo tourist trap. Or this is <laughs> definitely yeah. like, yeah, yeah. He's like, you got neon everywhere and it's great. Yeah. Yeah, but this is definitely great. Um, but um, if that's it, I guess we're going to our final thoughts now. Definitely. Sure. Yeah. So, TJ, what's your final opinion on this film? Uh, overall, I enjoyed this movie. Um, I do think, again, part of my, my you know, not being too familiar with Japanese filmmaking at this time, you know, some of, like, the transitions were a little abrupt, yeah. you know, uh, for my movie sensibilities. But all in all, I was able to follow things pretty well. I thought it told an interesting story, even if it ended up being a little predictable. I was pleased by the the humor, which I didn't really expect to be a part of the movie. Uh, I thought that it worked pretty well. I thought it was well acted, obviously well directed and photoed or photographed or whatever. Um, all in all, I'd say it was a damn solid movie. Uh, I would probably give it a four out of six. I think that the the theme of finding agency, uh, you know, in just playing with whatever hand you're dealt, whatever economic circumstances that you live in, or, you know, just whatever social situations you might find yourself in. I think those are fairly universal themes. And yeah. even the fact that some characters handle them very poorly, that is also universal. We're all human, right? We all make mistakes. And sometimes it can be funny. You know, the consequences of it can be a little funny. Sometimes they can be very harmful. Sometimes they can, they can be traumatic. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you're able to shift your your mindset, and if you need to, appro you know, in an appropriate way, find happiness in what you can control in life, and you will find self assuredness. Yeah, and uh, I think those are pretty much all universal, no matter where you're from or what time you're living in. Yeah. So I give it a four out of six. I thought it was a dang solid movie. I enjoyed it. Not sure if I'll ever rewatch it. But dang solid. Yeah. And I'd recommend it if you like, if you want to try something, uh, something different. Yeah, definitely. I agree with a lot of your opinions, definitely. Um, I had no idea what this movie was going to be. And I think I like this more on The Vengeance is Mine. Definitely just, I think just from the look of it. I mean, you can me tell, like, I, don't, I forget the budget of Vengeance is Mine, but my guess, I don't know if it was higher or not. But it definitely tells, like, this is more of a studio film than what Vengeance of Mine was. Um... You know, it's just a totally different tale, and of course, because it's a different movie, but, you know, I agree with a lot of what you said, um, you know, I found the absurdity great, you know, I found the, I found the acting to be really good, especially, uh, Kinta and Harako, mm -hmm. yeah, um, I think Harako was unknown at that time, too, and, like, Imoa discovered her, and, like, so she did a good job casting, um, so, yeah, um, I won't go into that details as you did because you probably summed it up perfectly the ideas of what I was going to say so I would also give this four and, four, four and a half stars out of six. Four and a half? I like yeah, it. Uh, yeah. Good, yeah. good. I would also argue if you like this one better than Vengeance is Mine yeah. I just looked it up I gave them both four out of six I'd probably give the edge to this one Yeah. I think it's because this one is obviously more relatable in its themes and I think it feels that way because it's it seems like it's more personal for Imamura. Yeah, sure. Right? Because he was he was yeah. a black market he was hustler Kinta back then. In a way, yeah. So yeah, I think and this definitely shows way. like the like because Vengeance in Mind it was like serial killer like that's the that's the other like like uh, side of the culture we don't want to talk about that much. But he like this side definitely more personal to him. It shows like like a side that's not just like insanity. It shows like what real people were dealing with back then. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well said. Okay, so that's our thoughts about it, folks. Now let's talk about Vincent Canby's thoughts about it. What? Mm. Dun, dun, dun. Where's Roger Ebert? Well, guess what? Roger Ebert didn't see this movie. Damn. He, he, he probably was busy back in the 80s. He, he probably had to pick up his dry clean. That's my guess. That's probably my guess why he didn't see this movie back in 1986. <laughs> probably. It was released in theaters in the United States. Um, Do you think he ever got mad at like a local business and gave them thumbs down? In yeah. Yeah. Definitely, so. yeah. So yeah, so I found a Vincent Canby, uh, New York Times article. He was the film critic for the New York Times. 
mm -hmm. um, from probably from the 1960s to the early 2000s, I guess. Um, very famous uh, film critic. Uh, yeah, he does not give a thumbs up or thumbs down. I feel like that, like, that's like, okay, so I definitely agree with some critics that, like, that kind of ruined a lot of criticism, because... Sometimes when I just look at reviews for anything, I just see the, uh, the score or whether it has like a star or something, and yeah. I don't read the criticism of it. So like when I go on like Pitchfork or something, I just see like which has the highest rating, and I just like okay, that's good music, and I don't read like why it's good music or why is it has why is this a seven point two instead of a eight point two, you know? So I do I do agree with that. Like they kind of just thumbs it up to thumbs up thumbs down. But of course, Roger Ebert gave great analysis of the film. Well, he was writing an article also, yeah. plus the thumbs up and thumbs yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, so definitely. And the star system. Um, Vincent Cameron did not really have a star system. I don't believe so. I didn't really look that deep into it. But um, his review is actually really, really great, and I agree with a lot of it. Um, he starts it by saying this film is a vivid panorama of small time hoods, hustlers, whores, influence peddlers, and kickback artists, all behaving with the manic intensity of Keystone Cops. I don't know what the fuck a Keystone Cop is. I don't, I don't either, but I love that. that Syntax there it was a phenomenal. Yeah, and from time to time, I end up dead. Um, he said, going to say about the direction of this film, photographed in a beautiful black and white, ultra wide screen. Uh, he calls it uh, Nika Shoe Scope, which I, I guess means that it's a joke on Cinemascope, you know. Mm. It's definitely, because it's filmed like uh, a smooth, glossy picture in Hollywood in the 1950s, he says, uh, which suits perfectly with the culture class, with the score. Keystone Cops, by the way. Yeah. There was a really old uh, slapstick comedy series about a bunch of goofy cops. Oh, that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, he goes on to say, um, with a section of Jisuko Yoshimura, who played Hoboko, with kind of delicate authority, the ultimate fights the film with its points, all actors fiercely overstate their emotions, of course, because this is a slapstick. This is... Because <laughs> yeah. he compares the keystone to cops. It's right. It's a slapstick... Outrageousness is this stupidity over stupidity. Um, he says that this makes possible Mr. Imamura's spectacular stage climactic sequence between the showdown between two rival gangsters, of course. It's brutal, but it's also funny and absurd as a cartoon. Because it is. Because it's, it's about pigs running them up through the city and trampling people. Right. Yeah. It is pretty damn goofy. Yeah. He says um, Pigs and Battleships is no more or less anti American than it is anti Japanese. It works with a singularity, intelligent filmmaker who persists in taking a long, satirical look in the view of things. Akira Kurosawa and Yusuo Juro Ozu both made films about post-war Japan where possessive American presence th throughout the film, although always remains something unidentified that's just off-screen. So they don't really show the American side of Japan that was influenced by, that, by us. So yeah, yeah, they just show the Japanese side. They don't show like, how America influenced them or like what caused... What what caused what effect the Americans had on Japanese culture? Um, in a most un-Japanese sort of way, Mr. Imamura deals with the situation directly. Pigs and battleships is professionally impolite, which is true because like we think of Japanese society, we think prideful, respectful, polite. You know, mm -hmm. but no nobody's polite in this film. They all want <laughs> money. True. They're all dirty. They're all stupid. They're all like yeah. It's an American influence. Yeah, I'm just kidding. I didn't. Yeah, definitely. That. Well, technically in the view, like, yeah, it is the American influence. I think that's probably the joke. Yeah. 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 That's pretty funny, actually. Yeah, so I, I agree with a lot of what he I says. Like that. Yeah. 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 So maybe now it's can be time, huh? Can be time. 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 I think like Ebert and Canby is fighting out right now and having them like, no, it's my it's Ebert time. No, it's Canby Probably. Time. Yeah. That's probably all that they have to do in heaven right now. Yeah. Just listen fight to, each other. Listen to us. Yeah. Probably. Mm -hmm. Um, let's go letterbox. It's got a three point nine stars, almost four. Uh, is it out of four? It's out of five, I believe. Okay. Yes, because you can go. That's still damn respectful. The highest you can go is yeah. five. Yeah, I think the highest I've ever seen is four point five, and that's for that was for Grave of the Fireflies. I gotta update my letterbox. Yeah. Um, Baltazar gave it four stars. There's certainly were a lot of pigs and Americans in this movie. <laughs> And Myth of Syphilis said four stars, befitting betrayal of society, pigs, and warships. Which really, we don't see a lot of battleships in this movie. We don't, just at the end. Yeah. That's kind, of, kind of misleading. A lot of pigs, no battleships. That's, yeah. Yeah. I was kind of hoping the pigs would ride a battleship. Yeah, that'd be cool. Point. Yeah. That would have been fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's the world and can be review of this film. Um, rewards. Rewards. 
awards. No. Awards. Awards. We're going to the awards section of this little podcast. Um, this was not nominated at all for any Oscar, uh, not foreign film. Um, this won the Blue Ribbon Award, which is a reward for... It's mostly given out by movie critics and writers. So this was chosen by every movie critic and writer in Japan. Mm-hmm. To be the best film of 1961. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, so yeah. So it won the Blue Ribbon Award for 1961 for best film. It's pretty badass. Um, so yeah, it wasn't nominated for best foreign film during that year's Oscar, which would be 1961. Uh, so nominees were Through a Glass Darkly, uh, Sweden, Harry and the Butler, Denmark, Immortal Love, Japan, The Important Man, Mexico, and Placido, Spain. So yeah, and the winner was that was Through a Glass Darkly. Uh, best films of that year was West Side Story, Fanny, The Guns of Navarone, The Hustler, and Judgment and Nuremberg. So really good movie year, 1961. Dang, yeah. Really good movie year. Yeah, those are good. That's a good yeah. year. Very good year. For yeah. Movies. Top 10 films in 1961, 101 Dalmatians, <laughs> West Side Story, uh, The Guns of Navarone, El Cid, uh, The Absent Minded Professor, starring our very own Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lewis. Who we've got to watch that film. It's so we're close. Still, yeah. It's so close to being out. Uh, what's it called again? It. Here, uh, the Day the Clown Cry. Today. So close to get that being released. There's nothing he can do about it either. Yeah. Jerry Lewis. He can't do anything about it, and we're going to watch it, That's and right. we're going to have a special episode about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, number six was The Parent Trap. Um, number seven, The Dolce Vita. Number eight, Levo Come Back. Number nine, Gone with the Wind. Still wow. killing it after 30 years. <laughs> That's incredible. Yep, the re-release is still going. Do you think at that point it reached like Rocky Horror phase where people would go and then, like recite things like I don't know, but things? it was a hit, hit, hit. I mean, That's in incredible. 1939 they would sell out like it. It was in the year for like it was in the theaters for like two or three years after stuff. That's incredible. Yeah. Really. So after like this is not the first time it's been released. I think like every ten years they released Gone with the Wind. Even now, I think I think now they still show it. Maybe in the hot houses and maybe they in AMC. I mean, I don't think it's gonna have the same like like um, financial impact that. It would have in like the 1960s or 70s or something like that, or 80s. Yeah. But, you know, it's still going to be released every 10 years because, you know, either whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, Gone with the Wind is in all film, all film culture, no matter what, you know, because. Hmm. Yeah, and I mean, in some ways, it was the first film, Blockbuster. It's definitely yeah. the most cultural film that's been released in America in the past 100 years. I mean, it still sees its influence to, to today, you know. And plus, also, its historical significance of it, showing racism in the South and. How, you know, like, this debate of, like, how it showed racism in the South and stuff like that. You know, definitely. You yeah, know, yeah. kind of like, um, you know, D.W. D.W. Griffith with Birth of a Nation. Yeah, yeah. The first film ever made, unfortunately, is made by a racist who was friends with the Ku Klux Klan. You know, it's yeah. like that. It's, you know, it's one of those things we have to carry, you know. Right, it's culturally significant. Yeah. No matter historically what, yeah. significant. Yeah. And number 10 was King of Kings. Yes. So, yeah. So, that was... Mostly it. Yeah, that's it. That was the film Pigs and Battleships. We gave our final opinion and thing. And now, we don't really have a ending game for it, unfortunately. We didn't well, I don't have a game. Yeah. But if there's no other business to attend to, I do have something. Okay. It was your birthday last week. It was. I was out of town. And In which no one came and I was alone. Blame PJ. I had previous engagements in Bridgeport, as I mentioned. And by that, I mean a tea time. Yes. But I do have a gift for you. Ooh. So gift time, now. folks. All right. I can finally cross you off my left for people. I'm going to hit with a fat. Okay. Ready to go. He did ask me about my size, so I wonder what it's about. Ooh, an actual gift. Last time you gave me a um, Richard Simmons calendar. <laughs> you asked my t-shirt size. What's it going to be? That's why I'm wondering. Gee, I wonder. Yeah. You can be real surprised when you get a tube size. I swear to God, this says like Frankie Muth Golf Court. What's this? What's this? M- MVP. <laughs> oh my God. It's Red Buttons. It's Red it's Buttons. Red Buttons. Yes. It's a shirt that says Red Buttons MVP. Yes. <laughs> you are the Red Buttons MVP. <laughs> this is from the movie she- They Shoot Horses, don't they? When he's tired and he's about to die, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> This is amazing. Thank you, TJ. You're very welcome. Yeah. You're very welcome. I hope you like it. I do love it. I'm going to wear this tomorrow. Good. <laughs> yeah. Please do. People are going to be so confused. Like, what is this? I'm like, you don't understand. As well they should. They really should, yeah. I actually researched on Reddit the best print, the best, best print company to, you know, for like washing, you know, the shirt 
and whatnot. Um, and this was the place that uh, was recommended. So I hope it lasts yeah. a long time. I do like that. It, it, it feels nice. Like the print yeah, on there is not nice. super, yeah. uh, you know, gritty or anything. <laughs> I just love it. You see it exactly when he dies. Exactly. This is, I'll post this on Twitter, guys, when I post the episode. But you can you see it exactly when he dies, and this is this MVP. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, because I wonder, like, what is this shot from? Like, no, this is exactly when he dies, and right. they shoot horses or something. <laughs> Thank you, TJ. Really appreciate it. You're Thank very you. welcome. I still think about that movie. That was a good movie. That was a good movie. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay, well, guys, that's the end of our show. I um, hope you guys liked it. Uh, if you please, if you like us, please follow us, subscribe to us on any on the platforms we're on. YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, Facebook, maybe Apple Music. I don't, I don't want to pay twenty bucks, but I don't know. I'll figure it out. Whatever. But yeah, follow us on there. Oh, um, tax deductible. Tax deductible. Yes. I guess this is a business, right? I don't know. Um, but yeah, follow us on Facebook on It's Tuned Us, uh, and also on on Twitter at it at it underscore damn it. Um, X E X. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But we have one more movie left, and that movie is called... And that movie is called Profound Desires of the Gods, our last film. Yes, it's going to be right. great, and then we'll do the rankings. So thank you very much, guys. Can't wait. Um, my name's Mo, and I'm going to Sada House. And I'm TJ, and I guess I'm going to load up some pigs, because you're bailing on that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. They're going to take my thumbs if I don't. That's fine. You throw new, new thumbs. Okay. Yeah. All right, see everybody. The tab, Robert Mitchum, play us out. Adios. Adios.